Good afternoon. My name is Fred Friedman, and I'm uh, pleased to uh, present a uh, program this afternoon on New Mexico short line railroads. This uh, activity is sponsored by the Historical Society of New Mexico, and there will be a number of interesting shows um, that you should probably tune into that are uh, in, the, in the works. Let me just give you a bit of background about myself before um, I launch into the show. Um, I, I have a fairly extensive background uh, relative to railroading in New Mexico. I ran the, uh, the State Transportation Department's Railroad Bureau for about 30 years. And upon retiring, I was hired by several law firms to investigate railroad accidents around the, the country and then served as an expert witness on a number of uh, railroad related issues. <clears throat> upon retiring from that, um, I, I belong to the State Historical Society, and I've been developing and uh, giving lectures on New Mexico railroading history, um, both state and territorial, for a number of years and find that to be very enjoyable. Um, the one that I put together, <clears throat> excuse me, this afternoon is on New Mexico short line railroad companies. <clears throat> In short lines, I'll get into a definition later, but there are about uh, 10 short line companies in New Mexico that essentially feed the main railroad lines. And uh, they're essentially the wind beneath the wings of the larger companies. And with that, I'll begin. These are the logos and the names of the companies that I'll be talking about. And um, just starting in the upper left corner is the Texas and New Mexico Railroad Company located in Hobbs and then runs down into uh, to te Texas serving the oil field industry with commodities that they need. The Southwestern Railroad is in the other southern corner of the state, dealing with the copper industry and providing goods and material for them. Um, the Navajo Transitional Energy Company is a Navajo-owned railroad with a lot of distinguishing and interesting characteristics that I'll also describe. Um, the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad is another short line railroad company, the remnants actually of a much larger railroad empire that existed in the early uh, 19th century. Um, there are some others and um, I, I won't describe them, but we can just get into the railroading history of some of these lines. <laughs> the lines developed relatively slowly as regional industries such as logging, mining, agricultural produce, um, uh, shipping of uh, cattle, sheep, and, and uh, other uh, ranch materials developed in territorial New Mexico. Um, there was both federal and territorial assistance for railroading development. And with the years, uh, that interest grew to the extent that between the time that the first railroad entered New Mexico, which was 1878, and the present time, there were about 125 railroad companies authorized to do business in the land of enchantment. That number today has been reduced to 10. Um, all of the 120 something railroads uh, obviously didn't operate at the same time, but they were created for a variety of reasons and they changed their names, they reorganized, some of them were bought up by major railroad companies, others were paper companies with absolutely no rolling stock, cars or equipment that were designed principally for the purpose of acquiring land and selling that land at an inflated price uh, later. I want to get into just very briefly a definition of a short line railroad. Um, um, almost intuitively, we think a short line railroad is one that is short in terms of mileage. The federal government, however, describes short lines differently, and railroads in generally are usually based on the amount of income that they generate on an annual basis. 
you'll hear railroaders talking about class one railroads. And by that, they mean the large railroad companies like the Burlington Northern Santa Fe, the Union Pacific, the Southern Pacific, the names that are common to most of us. Those railroads have to make about um, $450 million a year for that classification. And with that classification comes a bunch of federal requirements that they have to adhere to. Um, less than that amount of money or class two railroads um, have to generate between 447 million, but less than another figure. And the railroads that we have in New Mexico are known as class three railroads. And there are 10 of them and they make $35 million or less. And, and you'll understand why they are smaller railroads when we get into the details of them. This is a partial listing of the 120 something railroad companies that existed in New Mexico between 1878 and the present time. This is just a partial list. There are um, about four more pages uh, this intense of the railroad companies that used to operate here. L let me just say that it, it's interesting to note that railroads like the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe operated at different times under different names, but they were essentially the same railroad company. Um, going fur further with that explanation, um, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Company started out as the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. It was eventually changed to the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway Company, two different companies, different boards of directors, different legal requirements. Then it was bought up in the 1990s by the Burlington Northern Railroad, so it became the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. All of that is to say that a number of these railroad companies are known by different names. Another example is the Chile Line that was a nickname for the Durango and Silverton Railroad Company. But there are, se there are several of those uh, interesting um, variations and name changes for a lot of the railroads. In terms of mileage on uh, the existing companies today, the Arizona Eastern and Southwestern Railroad, the Santa Teresa Southern Company, I will get into in some detail, and uh, we'll go into the location of those lines on a map that uh, accompanies this discussion. Um, the railroads were important not only as economic generators for themselves, but they also, as I've said, fed the other larger railroad companies that were dependent upon them for offline um, freight and commodities that they, that they needed. And the shoreline railroads contributed substantially to adjacent communities so that workers could shop there, live there, send their kids to the school and pay taxes. Each one of the larger railroad companies interchange at various locations with the short lines. Uh, the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe has four um, interchange areas at Clovis, Vaughn, Belen, and Rincon. And Rincon is a very important railroad um, location, even though it looks like a relatively isolated spot on the way to Las Cruces um, if you're on Interstate 25. But Rincon, meaning corner, is really where the original Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe was, um, um, was trying to get to as it crossed over into New Mexico from Colorado because at that point the line split at Rincon. The um, one leg going to the west where that railroad could continue west through Lordsburg, Deming, um, in, in through Arizona and connecting with the Southern Pacific on the West Coast. And if it continued South, it could interchange with the Republic of Mexico and a number of railroads there. The Union Pacific picks up freight from a number of short line companies in two locations, one on the um, Western side of the state, Deming, and the other at Vaughan. <clears throat> 
This is the map of the railroads that uh, I was referring to um, previously. <clears throat> the red ones are the short line railroad companies in New Mexico, the class ones that make about $450 million a year, at least, are the Burlington Northern and the Union Pacific. We have some federal railroads, which essentially is Amtrak. And Amtrak took over from a lot of the railroad companies that used to provide uh, passenger service. And during the 1940s and 50s and after World War II, determined that passenger service was not uh, profitable and subsequently got out of the passenger business, um, hence creating a need for um, the development of Amtrak. And we have two Amtrak lines in New Mexico. One is the Sunset Limited that runs from New Orleans um, up through El Paso, uh, serving Deming, Lordsburg, before it continues on to California and um, uh, San Diego. The other Amtrak route that you may be familiar with is um, called the Southwest Chief. And it follows the route of the famous trains of the 1930s and 40s and 50s that stopped at the Fred Harvey establishments. And it runs um, from Chicago to Los Angeles, really coming in at Trinidad and Raton, going down through Las Vegas um, and, and uh, the city of Las Vegas and an entrepreneur there has recently rehabilitated one of the Fred Harvey hotels, the Castaneda. And, um, um, if, if the, uh, the, the COVID virus eventually um, dissipates, um, he's looking forward to uh, reopening that hotel and um, um, possibly others in the state. But those are the two Amtrak lines and we can now concentrate on the short lines of, uh, of the state. Before getting into that specifically, just um, uh, keep in the back of your mind that it took both federal and territorial legislation before railroads could really um, function and flourish in territories like New Mexico that had a lot of natural resources, but not particularly a lot of funding and a lot of support for railroads um, in the beginning. Some of the federal laws that influenced short line construction in New Mexico, include the Pacific Railway Act and several others, but most important to New Mexico is in fact the Pacific Railway Act, which was a series of laws beginning in 1862 and subsequently passed again by Congress with slight revisions in 63, in 1864, and again in 1865. There were a number of provisions in the Pacific Railway Act that affect New Mexico uh, dramatically. One was the fact that it was supposed to establish the Second Continental Railroad in Deming, and it did so in 1881. You may recall that the first Transcontinental Railroad um, um, occurred at Promontory Point, Utah, in 1869. So it was um, a number of years before the second one developed, but interestingly, it did in fact occur in New Mexico. The railroads got paid for developing the lines through the territory, 16,000 miles on the prairie and almost double that on, in the mountains because the terrain was rougher and it took more work. One of the other things that the Pacific Railway Act did to ensure that, um, transcontinental shipment of goods and material was the fact that standard gauge or the distance between two rails was um, um, mandated by the Pacific Railway Act. Prior to that, railroad companies often had their own gauge for their own equipment and their own needs. The problem with that was that it was almost impossible to ship material through the country because of the stand the changing gauge and, and the lack of standardization. That gauge incidentally, the distance between the rails is four feet eight and one half inches. There are various stories on why um, that gauge is as it is, one being that uh, that is the distance and the width of a Roman chariot and the Brits uh, British uh, railroads 
um, adopted that distance for their trains. And when um, railroading developed in the United States, a lot of it was modeled after the British. And again, it went back to the um, width of a Roman chariot, supposedly four feet, eight and a half inches. One final um, admonition of the Pacific Railway Act is the fact that railroad, the railroad, the Atlantic and Pacific Railway and the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railway was directed to build in the direction of Santa Fe, not to Santa Fe. There is a misconception that the railroad because of its name was supposed to build toward that city. Um, Congress wanted the railroad essentially to build in the direction of Santa Fe so that these uh, fellows in the photograph, the surveyors, could make the decision whether or not it was economically feasible to go ahead and actually build into the city. Um, their recommendation, in fact, was that it was not feasible nor worth the while of the railroad to build a Santa Fe. It took Ar Archbishop Lemay, um, um, territorial governor Lou Wallace and 14 substantial citizens to convince the railroad that they should in fact come to the city different. The territorial statutes were much more forgiving and accommodating to railroads than were, was the federal law. Through um, uh, statutes, um, promulgated in 1878 as a railroad approached, permitted the railroads to take whatever they wanted for the construction of the, of the lines. They could take springs, streams of water, anything they wanted on both private or public land. So eminent domain was an issue and a tool used by the railroads to acquire the right of way through the territory. First came the transcontinentals, which were the large railroad companies, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, the Denver and Rio Grande, Missouri Pacific, and names that you may be familiar with. And they brought with them national investors, money from outside of New Mexico, and um, pre prescription um, architectural forms for railway depots. And that's part of the reason that a lot of the depots in New Mexico look pretty much the same. And that's because there were standardized plans and they weren't building each one from scratch as were the smaller um, industrialized and smaller branch line railroads. The regional and local railroads followed the um, transcontinentals um, and they generally uh, consisted of mixed trains, meaning that there would be both passengers and freight on the same train. They exchanged freight with the larger carriers and um, they consisted initially of mining railroads, logging railroads, cattle uh, uh, transporting railroads, um, and lines like the Chile line that were known for moving um, agricultural produce, not only Chile, but apples from Española and other locations. The line that went out of Tomasita's restaurant in Santa Fe and went south was known as the New Mexico Central Line, but its nickname, like the Chile line, was the Pinto Bean Line because of the commodity it transported. And um, over, over on the right, we have a, a name, the names of some of the railroad companies that were the regional and local railroads. And they included uh, the Borough Mountain Railroad Company, the Lordsburg and Achita Railroad, um, the um, Cerritos Coal Railroad and, and a number of others. After World War II in New Mexico, things began to change rather dramatically for the railroad companies. And <clears throat> that's because trucking began to compete with the railroads. It was the end of the steam era. Airlines began to compete for rail passengers. Um, a number of railroads started to go bankrupt. The, um, uh, the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad went out of business. Um, you, you have a lot of the famous lines disappearing. 
Also at that time, there were labor issues that led to the disappearance of the caboose on a number of companies, lines, and eventually throughout the country. As a matter of fact, at this point in time, um, chambers of commerce and restaurants um, have more cabooses than do any of the companies in a railroad industry. Let's get into the short lines that, um, that serve the state. And um, the first one is the Arizona Eastern Whale Railway, and it is in the southwest uh, quadrant of the state um, near Lordsburg, and it's this little line that goes up to the Morency Copper Mine. And the job of that railroad, um, 23 miles long, is to pick up copper ore at the Morency Mine, bring it back to Lordsburg, um, at which point the Union Pacific Railroad will pick it up, take it down to the smelter plant in El Paso. So it serves the Morency Mine, it exchanges with the, uh, the Union Pacific, and um, railroads have track classifications as well. This is 30 mile or 40 mile in an hour class three track. Um, and this is an image of the Arizona Eastern Railway uh, locomotive and a number of cars carrying copper ore. The Texas and New Mexico Railway is on the other side of the state and it is a railroad dedicated principally to oil and gas development in New Mexico and the fact that uh, that industry requires a lot of mechanical goods, it requires pipes, um, lubricating oil, oil field materials and the uh, Texas and New Mexico Railway gets the, those um, materials from uh, the Union Pacific at Monahans, Texas, um, it, uh, some, I think it's 30 or 40 miles south of uh, the state border with Texas, connects to Monahans, gets those materials and brings them up to various jobbers um, in the Hobbs, um, JAL and Lovington area of, uh, of New Mexico. This is one of the Texas New Mexico locomotives. Um, their color, color scheme changes periodically as they're bought and sold by other investing companies. But on the larger map, the Texas New Mexico Railroad is this line here going into Texas. The Santa Teresa Th Southern is another railroad that um, has been ex in existence in New Mexico since the 1980s. And its job essentially is to provide the Union Pacific Railway at Santa Teresa and the port of entry um, with materials that it picks up from various locations, both in New Mexico and in the Republic of Mexico. This is a Google Earth shot of the Santa Teresa Development Center and uh, loading facilities and uh, switching tracks for both the Union Pacific and the Santa Teresa Southern Railway Company. The Santa Teresa Railway actually only owns a little more than two miles of track and it cooperates with several other um, corporate firms for the transfer and uh, development of uh, material as it uh, turns it over to the Union Pacific at Santa Teresa. The Southwestern Railroad is a, another copper haul line and it uh, has really two divisions. It has a Carlsbad division that runs from Clovis down to Roswell and then Carlsbad into Loving then turns around and comes, comes back and it serves the former Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe potash spurs um, that go east of the main line. Um, they load with potash and take it up to Clovis where they turn it over to the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway Company. There is also a second division of the Southwestern Railroad known as the Whitewater Division. This also used to be um, Atchison, Topeka um, territory and, and railroading. The, that railroad company um, essentially 
um, began to see that it wasn't profitable to be running up and down these short lines, hence the, uh, the trade-off and the purchase of the Southwestern Railroad to the, uh, um, um, for that particular industry um, occurred back in the uh, 1990s and the relationship has been very good for both the Southwestern Railway and the Burlington Northern Company. On the left side of the page, I've just list listed some facts that you can read for yourself. Um, but the Southwestern Railway has been growing and uh, has two divisions in New Mexico, and it's a railroad to watch for uh, further expansion. The Navajo Mine Railroad is one of the more interesting short lines in uh, the land of enchantment. It uh, is 13 miles long and is essentially a conveyor belt from the Navajo Mine to the um, Navajo uh, Four Corners uh, generating uh, facility. And there's another smaller facility that's also uh, being served by them. This is one of their new locomotives being brought in uh, by flatbed. This is one of the Navajo Mine Railroad uh, locomotives. And they also have another locomotive, their entire line being electrified with overhead electrical catenary wires. And the last time I visited this railroad, I was surprised to see that all of its locomotives are run by female Navajo engineers. And each one of these little coal cars is named after a Navajo chapter. So it's an, it's an interesting um, um, railroad company and um, it, it is circular. And like I said at the outset, it's essentially a conveyor belt for moving coal from the mine to the generating station. The rail, the New Mexico Railroad um, Rail Runner Express um, has been in existence since the year 2006. Um, it, it has not been profitable. Um, but in fairness to this railroad, no commuter line in the country is profitable, and they only are so in Europe because the government owns and subsidizes lines there. Um, the, the New Mexico Rail Runner Express had its beginnings in the 1960s when the University of New Mexico's School of Engineering did a feasibility study to look at the possibility and the um, advisability of ever building a commuter line between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. The School of Engineering's recommendation was that no, it wasn't worth it um, just because of costs. And um, subsequently, there were a number of studies done. Governor Tony Anaya um, is, is perhaps recognized by some for his idea of wanting to build what was defined as a bullet train between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. That never came to fruition either, although there were dozens of studies um, initiated on the feasibility of building such lines, how it would affect the six sovereign nations between Santa Fe and Albuquerque, what the economics and engineering issues and a number of other things. When um, Bill Richardson became governor, it was one of the planks of his campaign to make sure that line was built. And um, he was successful in generating both federal money and uh, state money in order to get the line constructed. And um, Two years after that funding was in place, uh, the first construction began and the New Mexico Rail Runner Express began its service. Um, and that, that service went south from Albuquerque to Berlin. And then the northern leg from Albuquerque to Santa Fe was constructed later with, uh, with stops at, um, let's see, between Santa Fe and Albuquerque were Sandoval, Kiwa, Pueblo, the county, the South Capitol. The, the original idea, well, let me go on to the next one. I, I'll include it here. This is a picture of Governor uh, Richardson. 
um, probably around 2006, when the inaugural train began, autographing the front of the locomotive um, as a centerpiece of his administration. There are both pros and cons associated with the rail runner itself. And the pros are that it conceivably is the beginning of a broader system connecting El Paso, Albuquerque, and Denver, possibly. It's also an economic generator and an investment in the future. Detractors of the line um, have a, a number of points. And one of them is that it's, it, its cost exceed its benefits for a state like New Mexico. Also that it tends to favor a region um, between Albuquerque and Santa Fe as opposed to the rest of the state. And as a consequence, Residents um, paying tax money in Deming, in Carlsbad, in Farmington, Clayton, Raton, and anywhere else it doesn't run, um, are not particularly enthused about paying for and sponsoring a transportation system for which they are convinced they get little benefit. Um, a, a, another concern generally um, that uh, has been shared um, to me through the state transportation department is the fact that legislatively and budgetarily, the rail runner takes literally takes money off the roads to the extent of deteriorating um, interstate highways and bridges uh, to pay for the continued operation of it. So you know, there are pros and cons to the rail runner and um, where you stand pretty much depends upon where you sit. The Cumbres and Toltec um, is a train that's been in operation for a number of years. And um, it has a long history. It was part of the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad Empire that was subsequently um, sold off in pieces over the years. And um, what remains is 32 miles of right of way in each state. And it runs in and out of the states of uh, Colorado and, and New Mexico and is a fabu fabulously attractive train ride uh, for a, a single day excursion for people that are interested in doing that. There is a joint railroad commission between New Mexico and Colorado that oversee the uh, budgetary uh, affairs of the Cumbres and Toltec. And the train has a, uh, um, a very large um, volunteer support group that does everything from maintaining track to um, cleaning up engines, cars, and depots. And the Cumbres and Toltec even has a program whereby individuals that want to pave a course um, to become a steam locomotive engineer certified by the Federal Railroad Administration can do so. So it's a, it's a very interesting economic uh, generator and it's been around since 1880. The Escalante and Western Railroad is another interesting railroad that uh, operates in New Mexico. And um, it's run and owned by the Western Fuels Association that has other railroads in other states. And it's been operating um, pretty much in relative obscurity for 35 years. And it is scheduled to end um, its operations um, this year. Um, essentially because uh, the use of coal is being diminished from what it originally was and a lot of places are going to cleaner fuels at this point. You may have seen um, the trains operating if you've been on I-25 going between Albuquerque and out toward Gallup. When you get to a location called Pruitt, um, if you look to the north, you can see trains in the distance and like the Navajo Railroad that I discussed earlier, this is another mine to generator um, rail, rail system and operates uh, pretty much like a conveyor belt, picking up coal and then dumping it off at the generating station rather than feeding it to another railroad. The Santa Fe Southern is the 
um, the latest acquisition of short line railroad companies in uh, New Mexico, and it has a very long history. <clears throat> it was built in 1880 by the Ashes and Topeka and Santa Fe uh, Railway Company only after um, they uh, were convinced by Archbishop Lamy, um, Governor Lou Wallace, and 14 other substantial and well-off uh, Santa Fe citizens convincing the railroad that they should build um, into the city and uh, provide service for, uh, for people there. Actually, the city needed a railroad for a number of reasons, one of them being in order to become a state, um, um, the territories like New Mexico had to be connected to adjacent areas, and the best way to do it was, was with a railroad. It has a very interesting history with a lot of ups and downs, and the reason that I put a Phoenix um, logo in the corner of this slide is to really illustrate the fact that this railroad has arisen from its own ashes on numerous occasions. And number one, I mean, it was built as an afterthought. Number two, it was uh, jettisoned by its builder in 1991 because it was too expensive to maintain the track, subsequently purchased by entrepreneurs in Santa Fe <clears throat> who kept it running for about 20 years. And then it was beginning to lie um, unused for a number of years until uh, three investors uh, last year purchased the line and its equipment and have um, some very interesting um, and attractive plans for redeveloping the line and reinventing it. And um, without them, um, this service would have been discontinued. The line would have been torn up and the right of way um, reverting back to adjacent landowners. That concludes uh, the discussion of short lines in New Mexico. And um, if there are some questions, I'd be glad to, uh, to take them either by phone or by email. And um, if you'd like to contact me and give me some suggestions on how future presentations might be improved, I would appreciate that as well. So thank you very much.